I found this recent story on Instagram on one of the, from the one of the people that I follow on there about this cop named Wayne Jenkins. And when I saw his mugshot or his picture, I immediately knew who he was because I remember doing a story or should say a video about him months ago, a few months ago, probably on one of the channels that got terminated. Well, an update just came out that he has received 25 years in prison for basically being one of the dirtiest cops probably to ever set foot in a police department. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this article that's coming from Salon.com, which is basically, I guess you could say like a quoted story from somebody who was there, not so much there with him, but closely involved with this case. And basically, this is their account of what they saw. So here we go. By the time we get to the end of it, it'll you'll pretty much see why this guy was considered to be one of the most corrupt cops in Baltimore. Many people in Baltimore and elsewhere were surprised to learn about the city's elite gun task trace task force, eight cops who were granted special outside the box privileges in an effort to get guns off the street. The city's problem with guns and violent crime is no secret. Baltimore has recorded more than a thousand murders over the last three years, and its crime rate is up ten times the national average. New York, with a population fourteen times larger, has had nine hundred seventy seven murders in the same time frame. The eight cops led by Sergeant Wayne Jenkins did more with those special privileges than get guns off the street. They created one of the most notorious gangs in the history of Baltimore using the protection of their badges to do everything from rob working citizens and drug dealers to selling drugs, instigating murders, destroying families, and draining the already struggling city with overtime fraud. If you live anywhere outside of Maryland, you may have never heard of the GTTF or its misdeeds as this case didn't receive nearly the national attention it deserved. All eight of the officers involved with the task force have now been convicted on various charges and are now being sentenced. I court last week because I wanted to see how much time they might get. I also wanted to see the faces of their family members and figure out whether these cops feel sorry for their actions, not just as a journalist, but also as a guy who had grew up in Baltimore under corrupt police just like them. The first hearing I attended was last Thursday at 10 a.m. in the Federal Courthouse building in downtown Baltimore. I haven't been there since my 20s when my best friend Tavon was sentenced to 27 years in prison for far less than what any of these cops have been convicted of doing. I remember reading his court document and bugging out. The United States of America versus Tavon Robinson, how do you beat the United States? The U.S. has torn entire countries apart, and we were just some wiry, wiry kids from East Baltimore. On my way in, they had to scan me with the wand a few times. I have a collection of metal in my body from various surgeries. Let me guess. You here for Jenkins, right? That was a courthouse guard with a heavy mustache blanketing his whole upper lip and half of the bottom one. Turn off your phone and head through those doors. Wayne Jenkins has been robbing young black dudes for years. I was never personally one of his victims, but he got a few of my close friends, so I thought the whole courtroom were well up with dudes that looked like me. Instead, the room was full of reporters, media types, and what appeared to be friends and family of Jenkins. But it was packed, and we were all hungry to see how much time this guy was going to get. He was at the top of the food chain, the GTTF capo, the guy who assembled the team. I greeted a few other journalists I knew and sat in one of the tight chairs in front of a group of people that looked like Jenkins' family members, members bunched together with matching frowns. The room was Coliseum style, just like I had remembered, with guards on each side and a clerk in the center. Cut off your tablets, cell phones, smart pens, laptops, and smart watches, the clerk said. If you are caught using them, they will be confiscated. Jenkins lawyer Steve Levin waited patiently, reviewing documents before he bounced up to greet the assistant U.S. attorneys Leo Wise and Derek Hines, two lanky, tall prosecutors who looked like an Ivy League backcourt. The clerk announced U.S. District Judge Catherine Blake shortly after that. She came out, made a stand, sat us down, and delivered the rules. Then Wayne Jenkins hob hobbled out in a maroon prison guard, looking nothing like his mugshot. He was balding and stocky. His face looked salty and bloated, probably from stress and eating prison food. He couldn't lift his head up high enough to glance at the crowd. Just like in the movies, Wise gave us a clear description of the things Wayne Jenkins had done, as stated he stole from drug dealers and innocent civilians alike. That wasn't all. He admittedly 
sold $1 million worth of drugs, pocketing $250,000 of profit. He participated in 10 armed robberies. He tainted 1,700 criminal cases, many of which have been overturned. He sent innocent people to prison, and he caused at least one murder. In fact, Jenkins probably caused many murders. If you rob a drug dealer, as he did almost daily, without locking him up or openly waging war, then the person that dealer owes money to is likely to kill him. But in this case, I'm talking about the case of 86-year-old Elbert Davis, a man who died after being hit by a car. That happened because Jenkins tried to rob a guy called Umar Burley at gunpoint. Burley didn't know Jenkins was a cop and fled the scene in fear for his life, running down Elbert Davis in the street. Jenkins has some people speak on his behalf, one being his kid's teacher who called him a good role model for kids. I'm not sure how she concluded that as if we weren't sitting in a court for a badge manipulating drug dealing dirty cop who ripped off a struggling city's taxpayers. I tried to hold in my laugh as she spoke and failed. The group of people in front of me, clearly Jenkins' family, turned around with dirty looks and wet faces. Surprisingly, I felt their pain. Regardless of all the hurt that Jenkins has caused, I know what it's like to see a family member face prison time. At that moment, he needed to address the court. He apologized to the Davis family and to Umar Burley, who spent more than seven years in prison as a result of Jenkins' lie. From the bottom of my heart, Jenkins sobbed. I wish I could take that day back. He didn't apologize to the scores of other people that he terrorized, making me think he wasn't sincere. Dude hurt so many people and only fixed his mouth to address one case out of 1,700. It was a great show for the courtroom, but it left me with the impression that it wasn't about accounting for his actions, but more about the fact he was caught. Why else would he only try to make things right with the victims who were present? Jenkins knew the media was there and had the opportunity to address everyone and still only focus on the people who showed up. Now, I'm one of those people who went to jail and found God, Jenkins pleaded as he wiped away his tears. I read the Bible 31 times. I can't stop reading it and praying for forgiveness. Maybe God was listening because Jenkins only got 25 years in prison. That's a great number considering the crimes he admitted to committing. The manslaughter, the kingpin level drug dealing, the epic corruption and fraud that included using his badge to send innocent people to jail. I have friends who received 30 to 40 years in the same, in the state penitentiary for nonviolent drug crimes. Jenkins may well get to serve out his sentence in some minimum security resort style cop jail. I don't remember Judge Blake or anyone else addressing all the money. Jenkins stole all the tax money he obviously evaded. But I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a citizen who feels like cops are never held accountable, even the ones who get convicted of serious crimes. No, he didn't get away with it entirely, but this sentence could potentially encourage other cops to steal smarter. They know the systems will sit the system will protect them as much as possible, even when they do wrong. That was, first off, that was a well-written, well-adjusted article. Shout out to the author of that. And you can tell that this was something, you know, this was from their own account. But, yeah, he, he's right. Even when they are held accountable, quote-unquote, they still get light sentences. As a matter of fact, I think they said one of the other cops that was involved um, got 18 years. So, it's like really a slap on the wrist, especially on that manslaughter one. Like, someone died at his hands. He should have got way more than that. I would have accepted probably no less, hmm, no less than 80 years. That way I know for certain, without parole, of course. That way I know for sure that by the time he's able to get out of jail, he'll, he'll probably be dead. I mean, 25 years, I don't know how old this guy is. But let's just say he'll probably be middle aged by the time he gets out, if he gets out. And like the person said, he's probably going to be in some low level security prison where, you know, nothing's really going to happen to him. So Jen Pop is pretty much out of the question. But yeah, you now have a glimpse into the most what they consider to be the most corrupt, dirtiest cop in Baltimore. Y'all let me know what you think down in the comments. Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you in the next one.